with her never when she trusted you, Brandon. Hamtramck is a small community in Michigan, mostly surrounded by the city of Detroit. It's a great commuter community for those who work in the city, lying just five miles away from the center. One night in February of 2012, a man in Hamtramck was waiting for his daughter and best friend to come home. As he just finished showering, he heard the girls pull up. Moments later, he heard a deafening scream. It was a cool night on Andrus Street in the southern section of Hamtramck on the 20th of February 2012. Charles McGuinness was inside drying himself off after getting a shower. He had been waiting for his 18-year-old stepdaughter, Abrea Brown, to arrive home. She had been out for a meal that evening with her 21-year-old best friend, Ashley Conaway. Abrea was a student at Wayne County Community College and she was working as a clerk at a local toy store. As for Ashley, she had graduated from Cleveland Intermediate School as valedictorian in 2008. She too was attending Wayne County Community College, where she was studying to become a nurse. Ashley was super compassionate, and a career helping other people had really appealed to her. To pay her way through college, Ashley was working part-time the Kentucky Fried Chicken in St. Clair Shores. Both Abrea and Ashley had big ambitions and bright futures ahead of them. They had been the best of friends since childhood, and they both lived together at the home on Andrus Street with Charles. At around 10pm, Charles heard Abrea and Ashley pull up. He then heard screaming. As he quickly made his way to the front door, he heard frantic banging on the door. Charles recollected, I ran straight to the door and snatched it open. Charles flung open the front door to witness Abrea and Ashley being dragged to the trunk of a silver Chrysler Concorde. There were at least two men. One was bundling Abrea and Ashley into the trunk of the car while the other was standing close by. He was armed with a gun, and when he spotted Charles on the doorstep, he opened fire. Charles responded by grabbing his own gun that was in his bedroom. He bolted to the front door and began firing back before the car sped off with Abrea and Ashley in the trunk. Charles immediately called police and they responded to the scene within two minutes. Upon approaching the bungalow, they immediately noticed shell casings littered across the ground and bullet holes that riddled the home. Outside the home, they found Abrea's car. The engine was still running and both doors were wide open. Abrea's handbag was on the ground with the contents spilling out. Based on the scenario before them, it appeared as though Abrea and Ashley were intercepted as soon as they arrived back home. They may have even been followed by their abductors. As Charles was describing the abduction incident to police, his phone began to ring. He picked it up to hear Abrea on the other end of the line. She was whispering as she told him that she and Ashley were in the trunk of a car. Hamtramck police requested the assistance of the Michigan State Police and the Detroit Police Department as the search for Abrea and Ashley got underway. As the search was in its infancy, Ashley's sister's phone pinged. She had received a text message. They got us, the text message ominously read from Ashley. Minutes later, another text message from Ashley came through. It simply read, Help. After this text message, all contact with Abrea and Ashley ceased. Investigators were immediately notified by the family of two potential persons of interest, 25-year-old Brandon Lewis Kane and 34-year-old Andre Michael Douglas. They certainly were likely suspects. Ashley had been somewhat romantically involved with Kane, but she knew that he was a dangerous and hot-headed man. 
On the 8th of February, Ashley was invited by Kane to Douglas's home in Glastonbury, Detroit, to hang out. Ashley didn't really want to go, but she told her sister that Kane had been persistent, so she decided to go and see him for a couple of hours. Not only were Douglas and Kane at the home, but another man as well, 24-year-old Bryant Christopher Lee. The small group were hanging out drinking in the driveway when Ashley decided she wanted to go home. Kane responded by bursting into violence, telling Ashley that he wanted her to come home with him. Ashley refused, and fearing for her safety, she turned to her best friend. She called up Abrea and asked if she could come and pick her up. Abrea agreed and she pulled up outside the home shortly thereafter. Ashley got up from her seat and she began walking towards Abrea's car. Kane followed. He threatened that if they drove off that he and Lee were going to open fire on the car. He then turned to Lee and ordered him that if the car started to move, to shoot Abrea and then shoot the car. Ashley knew that Kane wasn't joking around, but they were in a dangerous situation either way, whether they drove off or whether they stayed. Kane then chillingly commented that he had already beat two murder cases and didn't mind making them a third. Abria, who was sitting in the driver's seat, was essentially frozen in fear. She told Ashley that she was too afraid to drive off. Ashley got out of the car and swapped seats with Abrea and pushed her foot to the pedal. The car went roaring down the street, but before they reached safety, Cain made good of his word. He ordered Lee to shoot the car, to which Lee complied. Abrea and Ashley ducked and dodged the bullets as Ashley pushed her foot to the pedal as hard as she possibly could. She then felt a searing pain on the side of her head. She had been grazed by one of the bullets. Abrea and Ashley went directly to police to report the terrifying ordeal. A warrant was issued for Cain. While it had been Lee to fire the shots at Cain's request, Abrea and Ashley were too busy attempting to flee for their lives, but they hadn't actually noticed who was shooting, and they assumed that it was Cain. Investigators contacted Cain's attorney, Wright Blake, to have Cain turn himself in, but Cain flat out refused. A couple of days after the shooting, Cain attempted to bribe Abrea and Ashley into not testifying against him if he were to go to trial for the shooting. He offered them $5,000, but they were having none of it. They both knew how dangerous Cain could be, and what was to say he wouldn't try and kill them again? Ashley was having none of it, and she responded to Cain, No, you tried to kill me. Ashley had recorded the phone conversation during which she says to Cain, I'm scared. I don't know what the fuck y'all are going to do. That's a day I'll never forget. I wish I could have recorded it. This wasn't the first time that Cain or Douglas had found themselves in trouble with law enforcement. Both men had criminal records. In 2006, Cain received a one to seven year prison sentence for receiving stolen property. That same year, he pleaded guilty to assault with intent to commit great bodily harm, less than murder. Three years later, he received a one to seven year prison sentence for fleeing and eluding police in Oakland County. As for Douglas, in 2008, he was charged with possession of a firearm while under the influence and operating a vehicle while under the influence. With two persons of interest already identified by the family, the search for Abrea and Ashley, as well as the search for the two persons of interest, was ramped up. A bit later that night, as the search was in motion, a man near Lasher and Fankill on the east side of Detroit was lying in bed when he heard the distinct sound of gunshots. He called up police and they responded to the area, where they found a car that was in flames near an abandoned garage, near where the gunshots were heard. As they waited for the fire department to arrive, they couldn't help but notice that the burning car matched the description of the car that was used in the abduction. Once the fire was extinguished, officers searched the car. 
half expecting but not hoping to find the bodies of Abrea and Ashley. However, the car was empty. As they searched further, hoping to find some clue that could point them in the right direction, they noticed that there were bullet holes inside the car. The car was towed away for further inspection. Abrea's mother, Lois, pleaded for the safe return of her daughter outside the police headquarters. She appealed to the kidnappers, telling them, Please bring my baby home. She won't testify against you. Just the following day, Douglas handed himself into Hamtramck Police. He was taken into custody by Detroit police and interrogated in relation to the disappearance. While Douglas had been named as a person of interest, He was simply that. He was not suspected of being one of the men involved in the abduction, but he had been there when the earlier shooting took place. Police announced later that day that there was a third person of interest in the case, 24-year-old Bryant Christopher Lee, who was identified as the earlier shooter at Douglas's home. They believed that Lee was one of the abductors. Much like Douglas and Kane, Lee's face was plastered across the news, and later that night police received a phone call from a woman who believed that she had seen Lee in Whitmore Street in Pontiac. Police immediately responded to the scene, and at around 10.30pm, they arrested Lee without incident. With both Douglas and Lee behind bars, the search for Kane continued, as well as the search for Abrea and Ashley. Investigators suspected that Abrea and Ashley were with Kane. He was a parole absconder with a history of fleeing police. Lewis would appeal to Kane, telling him, Oh, Brandon, that was not worth it at all. If you did what you did, then it's on you. Why did you have to take my baby from me? Kane was arrested in Detroit that night and brought to police headquarters to be questioned. The following morning, he was charged with the earlier shooting. He was arraigned in Detroit's 36th District Court on two counts of assault with intent to murder, two counts of assault to do great bodily harm, and two counts of felonious assault. During the hearing, Kane entered a plea of not guilty. All three men were now in custody, but yet Abrea and Ashley still remained missing. The family were still clinging on to the hope that they were still alive and well albeit no doubtedly traumatised from the ordeal. Their hopes were bolstered by investigators, who said that they still believed that, despite the burnt-out car, Abrea and Ashley were alive. They just needed to figure out where, and then get them back home. Investigators were working on a certain theory. They believed that Kane and Lee had driven over to the home to once again offer Abrea and Ashley more money not to testify against them in relation to the earlier shooting case. Investigators speculated that, like beforehand, Abrea and Ashley refused to accept the money. According to investigators, they speculated that one of the men placed a gun to the head of one of the women, prompting them to both scream as they were forced into the trunk of the car. It was a terrifying scenario, and in a bid to generate some leads, the family put forward a $10,000 reward for information that could lead to them. Abrea's mother, Lois, said to the Detroit News, I'm so worried, concerned. Is she hungry? Is she thirsty? Did they beat her? Did they rape her? Ashley's sister, Latrina, also pleaded for some information, stating the time was of the essence. She said, These could be your sisters. These could be your daughters. We have to stop letting bad men do bad things in our city. Please, if you could please help us find Ashley Conaway and Abria. Please pray for my family. Please bring my sister and her best friend home. With the three men behind bars, the search for Abria and Ashley continued. Police were assisted not only by Abria and Ashley's families, 
but by concerned members of the community, who were canvassing the city and printing out missing person flyers. Brenda Hall, a member of Crime Stoppers and Mothers of Murdered Children, said that they were determined to find the Jew. The search entered its third day, but still Abrea and Ashley remained missing. Their families were able to increase the reward fund for information up to $30,000, which was a fine incentive for anybody who may have been harbouring information. That night, they held a candlelight vigil which stood as a beacon of hope that the two would be back home soon. The family were upset by how the case was being handled. They were learning a lot of information from the media when it should have been coming from the police working on the case. Very little had come out about the burned car that was found in Detroit. Police hadn't yet publicly stated whether there could have been a connection between the car and the girl's abduction, but their presence was noticeable in the area where the car had been found, indicating that they were still examining the car and the surrounding area. Feeling the pressure, investigators would announce just the following morning that the burned-out car was indeed connected to the abduction of Abrea and Ashley. As the car was being thoroughly examined, they found remains of Abrea's driving license. The news was devastating. As mentioned, the car had been burned out and there were bullet holes inside the car. It really wasn't looking good. And that evening, Abrea and Ashley's family would come together in a small hall at the corner of St. Aubin Street with other members of the community for a vigil. Lois implored those in attendance to join her at noon the following morning to hand out flyers. Her voice was shaky with emotion as she thanked everybody for all of their support over the past couple of days. While Ashley's stepmother, Lisa Conaway, asked everybody to continue praying for their safe return. The investigation took a swift, dark turn. Just the following morning, when investigators announced that they believed that Abrea and Ashley had been shot and killed and then buried. They further disclosed that while examining the car, they found not only a Bray's driving license, but also the head of a shovel. Investigators had also found that a Bray and Ashley's cell phones had pinged to Eliza Howell Park in Detroit, which wasn't too far away from where the burnt-out car had been found. This information led investigators to the park and they began searching for Abrea and Ashley, or at least some kind of evidence that could lead them in the right direction. They were looking specifically for disturbed soil, and they had the assistance of cadaver dogs. The park was very large, around 140 acres, so they had a difficult task ahead of them, and the first day was unfruitful. The following day, they were back at the park and they had the assistance of a police helicopter, as the officers down below pushed their way through the deep brush of the park. Despite what investigators now believed, Abrea and Ashley's family were still clinging on to that tiny thread of hope that they were still alive, with Lois suggesting that they were bound and gagged somewhere, and with the suspects in jail, they were all alone. While they were hoping... Lois also commented that she was a realist and knew that the outcome was most likely going to be bleak. It had now been one week since the girls were abducted and time truly was of the essence, just as it was on day one. Then on the 12th of March, Lee was charged with attempted murder in relation to the earlier shooting case. Hope was fading fast and the day slowly continued to pass. Bray and Ashley's family struggled with the uncertainty, the not knowing where they were or whether they were even alive. Investigators and volunteers alike, including the family, continued in their search for the next couple of weeks. Focusing on Eliza Howell Park and the surrounding area, there was a river that ran through the park, Rogue River. On the 24th of March, almost a month after Abrea and Ashley were abducted, investigators were combing their way through a heavily wooded ravine that surrounded the Rogue River when they noticed some disturbed soil, which was covered by five heavy logs. A police cordon was set up around the area, 
as investigators began to dig. Around four inches into the ground, they observed a body. They carefully continued to excavate the grave, and as they moved away more soil, they came across a second body. It was the fully clothed bodies of Abre and Ashley. They were gagged and bound with duct tape, which had been wrapped around their hands, wrists and legs. Both of them had been shot once in the head. Near the grave, investigators found a broken shovel. Based on the appearance and clothing of the two women in the grave, it was evident that it was Abrea and Ashley, but their fathers needed to come down to the medical examiner's office to positively identify them. The discovery was crushing to Abrea and Ashley's families. They had all but given up hope that they would be found alive, but still, they clung to that tiny glimmer of hope. Shortly after they were identified, the families of Abrea and Ashley were in court for a preliminary hearing for Lee. Outside of court, Ashley's sister, Latrina, said, Two beautiful women who will never have the opportunity to grow, to have families, to experience life. It's a travesty. It's a shame. Abrea's mother, Lois, also made a comment. She's in the kingdom of heaven. I'm very glad we have the suspects in custody. Now we don't have to chase them down. Now, I am in mourning. Just like Abrea and Ashley had done everything together in life, it was decided by the families that they would have a joint funeral. It was scheduled for the 2nd of April at Solomon's Temple on the city's northeast side. Thousands of people turned up to the funeral with many spilling out into the street. A slideshow depicting the lives of Abrea and Ashley was displayed near the altar as people took turns to reminisce about the lives of the two of them and call for an end to domestic violence. Raphael Johnson, founder of the community activist group The Detroit 300, warned women that if they were in an abusive relationship, they must kick them to the curb. During the service, People also implored the mourners to take responsibility in blighted neighbourhoods. There had been a spike in violence in Detroit, and many commented on this, saying that something needed to be done to prevent further violence. Following the emotional service, Abrea and Ashley were buried in matching coffins next to one another in adjacent graves at Woodlawn Cemetery in Detroit. Nobody had yet been charged with the murders and the investigation was still ongoing. Just the day after Abrea and Ashley were laid to rest, investigators announced that there was another person of interest in the murder case. They had discovered that on the day of the abduction, a man had entered a local Kmart and purchased two shovels. While this could have been completely innocent, they wanted to identify this man. As investigators were trying to identify this new person of interest, Cain and Lee were ordered to stand trial on the earlier Detroit shooting. Just the next day, Prosecutor Kim Worthy announced that her office was charging five men with the torture and murder of Abrea and Ashley. This investigation took on full speed ahead and consistently worked on by these organizations. And in the last 36 hours or so, it's been literally around the clock. These five men were Brandon Cain. 24-year-old Miguel Rodriguez, 24-year-old Reginald Brown, 19-year-old Jeremy Brown, who were cousins and unrelated to Abrea and Brian Lee. They were all being charged with first-degree murder, torture and unlawful imprisonment. Prosecutor Worthy commented, This case represents many of our fears when it comes to vital witnesses in a case. These women were heroic. They refused to relent and let these defendants deter them from continuing on with their previous case, and they paid with their lives. While investigators on the case had been remaining very tight-lipped, they had established a timeline of events leading up to Abrea and Ashley's murder and the aftermath. The man who purchased the shovels was identified as Miguel Rodriguez. Investigators had tracked him down and brought him in to be questioned. 
Down at the police headquarters, investigators were surprised when Rodriguez made a full and detailed confession implicating the four other men in the abduction and murder. Just the day before Abrea and Ashley were abducted, an attorney contacted police to speak about Kane handing himself in to be arrested in relation to the earlier shooting incident. Kane knew that his time was well and truly up. And there was only so long he could hide out for, avoiding detection. Kane contacted Reginald Brown, who was described as a full-service killer for hire, and arranged for him to abduct Abrea and Ashley. Reginald then enlisted the help of his cousin, Jeremy Brown, and another relative, Miguel Rodriguez, who would be the go-between in the plot, the one to pick up several items to assist in the crime. Cell phone records placed the Brown cousins in or near the area where Abrea and Ashley were abducted from. This was how they had become suspects in the abduction and murder. It was first of all believed by investigators that it was Cain and Lee who had abducted Abrea and Ashley. But they soon learned that it was in fact the Brown cousins and Cain. That night, the Brown cousins and Cain lay in wait for Abrea and Ashley to return home. As soon as they opened their car doors, the grim plan was put into motion. Abrea and Ashley were stuffed into the trunk of the car as Cain exchanged gunfire with Charles. Abrea had her cell phone in her pocket, and she scrambled around in the dark of the trunk to lift it from her pocket. She was able to call Charles, and then they sent a text message. They attempted to call 911, but it wouldn't be connected. Shortly thereafter, Cain called up Rodriguez and asked him if his mother had some duct tape. He wasn't too sure, but he said that it was unlikely. Cain then asked Rodriguez if he would go and pick up some duct tape and shovels. Rodriguez couldn't drive, so he asked his friend, Tristan Cash, to pick him up at his home. Tristan drove Rodriguez to a nearby Kmart, where he purchased two shovels. Tristan then drove Rodriguez to meet Cain at a home on Riverview. This home was just a stone's throw away from where the bodies of Abrea and Ashley would ultimately be found. Tristan pulled up outside the home and Cain came out. He took the two shovels from the trunk of the car and moved them around to the back of the home. Rodriguez then asked Tristan if he could drive him to a gas station. They pulled up outside the gas station and Tristan sat in the car as Rodriguez purchased a red gas can and then filled it up with gas. Rodriguez ordered Tristan to drive back to the home on Riverview. When they arrived back at the home, there was another car outside. The car used in the abduction. Tristan remained in the car as Rodriguez went into the home. He remained there for around 10 minutes before coming back out and climbing into the car. When Rodriguez came back, Tristan looked on as two bound and gagged women were led from the trunk of the car into the pitch black woods nearby by the group of men. It was Abrea and Ashley, and they were being led to their death. Just a couple of hours later, Jasmine Richbow, who was a cousin of Abrea, was at the home of her on and off again boyfriend when his cousin, Reginald Brown, showed up at the home with his cousin, Jeremy Brown and Rodriguez. Jasmine immediately noticed that Reginald was covered in mud. He lifted a wad of cash from his pocket and flashed it to Jasmine and her boyfriend before making a joke about the lengths he would go to for money. Jasmine was completely unaware at this point in time that Abrea and Ashley had been abducted and killed, so she really thought nothing of it. She watched on as Reginald pulled out a black automatic handgun from his pocket and asked Jeremy to clean it with bleach and get rid of the bullets. Jeremy then approached Jasmine, and he handed her a brown handbag that looked very similar to one that Abrea had owned. But again, Jasmine didn't see the significance at the time. As the brown cousins and Rodriguez were with Jasmine and her boyfriend, Kane and Lee showed up at the home of Audrey Glenn. Audrey and Kane were in a friends with benefits situation, the conversation turned to their relationship. 
Gain asked Audrey when they could be together properly. And Audrey informed him that they couldn't because he was seeing Ashley on the side. Kane alluded to the fact that Ashley was no longer in the picture. Did Mr. Kane, and this is offered only against Mr. Kane, say to you or ask you about the state of your relationship? When we was going to be together. Okay. And in response to that, what did you tell him? I said no because you have Ashley. Okay. And what did he say in response to that? You don't have to worry about her no more. Once Ken and Lee were identified as persons of interest in the abduction, the Brown cousins showed up at Tristan Cash's home. They were extremely flustered, as Reginald said to Tristan, Somebody snitching. I think it's you. Tristan assured the cousins that it wasn't him, because it really wasn't him. Shortly after this conversation, Tristan did speak with investigators to reveal the events of that night which matched Rodriguez's version of events. During Rodriguez's confession, he admitted to purchasing the shovels and the gasoline, but he claimed that he never asked Cain why he wanted the items. He commented, I feel fucked up. I didn't know he was going to do some shit like that. I paid for the shit with my card. During the confession, Rodriguez did not implicate himself in the abduction or murder. But the judge would order that all five suspects, Cain, Lee, the Brown cousins and Rodriguez, were going to be standing trial for the double murder. Rodriguez's defence attorney, James McGinnis, shared his dismay at the decision, contending that his client had fully cooperated and was being unfairly charged with the murders. Before the murder trial could go ahead, Cain and Lee first of all needed to stand trial for the earlier shooting incident. This trial began in August of 2012, and there were separate juries for both defendants. During opening statements, Kane's defence attorney, Wright Blake, essentially admitted that he was guilty of that prior shooting. He said that his client was remorseful, and admitted that he had offered her $5,000. But he claimed that this wasn't a bribe to prevent her from testifying, but instead money to pay for her medical expenses. Defence Blake said that Kane had called Ashley the following day to apologise and see how she was doing after being grazed by the bullet. He stated, It's true, he doesn't want to go to jail. Nobody wants to go to jail. There really wasn't much of a defence for the case and the jury convicted both Kane and Lee of assault with intent to murder after just deliberating for an hour. When the verdicts were handed down, Abrea and Ashley's families began to cry, before hugging one another and then thanking the prosecutors. With this trial complete, it was now time for the murder trial. Before then, however, Rodriguez was offered a plea deal. He accepted it and he pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. As part of the plea agreement, he needed to testify against the other defendants in their upcoming trial. The murder trial began on the 29th of October 2012. During opening statements, Assistant Prosecutor Molly Kettler described Kane as the ringleader behind the brutal murders, stating, It is impossible to find the words of the horror, the terror, the mental torture they suffered as they were driven around knowing they were going somewhere to be murdered. According to Prosecutor Kettler, The Brown cousins and Rodriguez got involved in the murders simply for money. They wanted money, and Cain had offered them money. As for Lee, the prosecution contended that he played an active role in the planning. The lawyers for the other defendants turned their attention to Rodriguez, claiming that he had pointed the finger at his co-defendants to avoid a possible life sentence in prison. Prosecutors had gathered a handful of evidence, including the earlier shooting, cell phone data, and Rodriguez's confession. The defence team for the respective defendants tried to cast doubt simply by claiming that their clients were not guilty. During closing arguments, Jeremy Brown's defence attorney, Nija George's Mihana, spoke as though he were a Bria. He said, There is no justice to convict the wrong person in this case. That will not bring us back. Prosecutor Kettler admonished him for doing so, 
stating, He does not speak for a brave brown. He does not speak for justice. Shame on him for standing here and saying a brave brown's name. She described the terrifying scenario Abrea and Ashley were faced with before they were killed, telling the jury, They couldn't cry for help. They could not escape. They could not avoid seeing. Their eyes were uncovered. The two juries would ultimately find all four defendants guilty of first-degree murder. While it had been expected that Rodriguez would testify, in the end he didn't. Prosecutors never disclosed why, but questions were raised in regard to his plea agreement and whether it would still apply. During a brief court hearing, it was decided that the plea agreement would be upheld. Rodriguez was to be sentenced first. He shuffled into court and stood before Judge Fonda Evans. He did not hold back when addressing him. She referred to him as a coward and a loser and said he could wash his body, but he could never wash his soul of the blood that's on it. She stated, Let me tell you something about yourself. You're a chameleon who will do anything to fit into a situation. When you realise the police were on you, you throw everybody under the bus while trying to protect yourself. You've tried to minimise your involvement, but you were a willing participant, and shame on you. Before the sentence was handed down, Abrea's mother, Lois, provided a victim impact statement during which she said she could never forgive Rodriguez for his involvement. He stared at Lois expressionless, as she said, I'm so heartbroken. I can't even describe it in words. I'm devastated. I want a life for a life. Judge Evans then addressed Lois, telling her, Sometimes people get caught up in how someone died, instead of celebrating how they lived. These two women tried to heal each other, and became symbols of triumph, not tragedy. Miss Brown, you said you can't forgive the defendant, but forgiveness isn't something you do for others. It's for yourself. I am challenging you to go forward. These young girls symbolise the womanhood of our community. Now you have to decide. Do I die in my past, or live in my future? If you make the decision to die in the past, then you're not honouring the memory of these two women. Stop grieving and start living. Miguel Rodriguez was sentenced to 20 to 35 years in prison. As he was being led from the courtroom, he asked if he could talk to his family. The judge replied, Oh no, get him out of here, get him out of here. Outside of court, Rodriguez's mother approached Lewis, and she apologised for her son's actions. She then gave her a massive hug. The sentencing phase of the other defendants came the following month. Once again, there were victim impact statements. Latrina, Ashley's sister, addressed Kane. You, sir, have are a prime example of nurture versus nature. Nurturally, you, somewhere, through your 20 block radius, through your bright moor navigation, got real twisted. I can hear intelligence all through you. I can feel the understanding of God from you. But in terms of master, what you created, what you founded, what you established, sir, you could have went a whole nother route. We could be standing here applauding Mr. Brandon Kane, but today we stand here with afflictions from Mr. Brandon Kane. Mr. Brandon Kane could have placed his hands in so many perfected areas. Mr. Brandon Kane could have been somebody. Mr. Brandon Kane could have been effectual within his 20 block radius. Mr. Brandon Kane could have taught, led a nation. You have something with so unique within you, Mr. Brandon Kane, that you have people thinking that you are the master. However, you shall see the true master as you walk within the Michigan Department of Corrections. I want you to understand, sir, with your divisive and corruptive and your devastating manipulation actions to a man, to men, that you could have led people and made people do and be better, but you led them. 
them to take two innocent young girls. She was so sweet. She was so kind. She was so beautiful, Brandon, and you know this. You had her by your side. She trusted you. My baby sister would have never gone with five men. She wouldn't have never, but she trusted you, Brandon. It was something in your leadership that she saw in you. It was something in you, Brandon Kane, that she looked up to. Me, mother of five children, 30 years with one man. She saw something in you, Brandon Kane, and you took that. Judge Evans sentenced Kane and the Brown cousins to life in prison. In handing down the sentence, she referred to Cain as the mastermind and referred to Reginald Brown as a disciple of destruction. The Brown cousins and Cain were also sentenced to an additional 20 to 50 years for each torture conviction, which were to run concurrently, and 35 months to 15 years for each unlawful imprisonment conviction, which were to run concurrently. She then sentenced Lee to 45 to 80 years in prison. Abria Brown and Ashley Conaway were terrified about going to police to report the earlier shooting. They knew just how dangerous Brandon Kane and his friends were. But still, they put their fear to the side and they did what they knew was right. Ashley had feared that another woman could fall prey to Kane, and she wanted him behind bars. She felt comfort knowing that she had the full support of her best friend. In the end... It was Abrea and Ashley that paid the ultimate price simply for trying to do the right thing. Well, besties, that is it for this episode of Morbidology. As always, thank you so much for listening. I'd also like to say a big massive thank you to my lovely new Patreon supporters, Jay, Janine, and Lori. If you want more episodes of Morbidology, you can join me on Patreon for bonus episodes of Morbidology Plus, as well as ad-free and early release episodes, bonus content, merch, and of course my undying love. You can join Patreon for as little as $1 a month and there are absolutely no obligations you can cancel any time. Could I also ask a massive request and ask that if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts from. Ratings and reviews are an easy way to support a show that you like, and I really do like to hear your feedback. Also remember, I'm going to be at CrimeCon in Glasgow on the 10th of September. It's just a one-day event this time, and I'll be on Podcast Row all day. I have a 10% discount code if any of you are able to make it. Just head on over to crimecon.co.uk and enter the promo code MORBID for 10% off your ticket. Also remember to visit us at morbidology.com for more information about this episode and to read our true crime articles. And please stay tuned to the end of this episode to hear a promo for the amazing true crime podcast, Cult Vault. Until next time, take care of yourselves, stay safe, and have an amazing week. Hello listeners, my name is Casey, host of the Cult Vault podcast, a long-format interview-based show that focuses on cults, high-demand groups, captive organisations and more. Each week, I interview a different cult survivor who brings a story of coercion and exploitation along with their own fight for freedom. With nearly 200 survivor interviews from all over the world, you can also find deep dives into infamous cults, interviews with leading experts